baby on the deals, Nick. All right, so this is the second lecture now on uh, crash recovery. So again, on Monday we talked about how uh, every recovery, the recovery algorithm of a database system is what it uses to ensure that all the transaction changes that, that commit successfully are durable, that we assure that all the changes are atomic, we don't have any partial transactions, and that we can restore the database and come back in the correct state. And we said that these recovery algorithms have two parts. On Monday, we talked about what we did at runtime, the data we had to collect and store it out the disk that we could then use for the second part of these algorithms, which is what we're going to talk about today, of when you come back after a crash, after a restart, and you look at the data that you set aside or collected during normal operations, you use that to figure out what the hell was going on and how do you go back to the correct state. Okay, so today we're focusing on, on the second part here. Right? We're assuming we've crashed, we've got to come back and figure out what was going on and put us back to where we should be. So the, the, the protocol or the methods we're going to talk about today are, come from this seminal paper called ARIES, right? the Algorithms for Recovery, Isolation, and Exploiting Semantics. So the, I don't know if the textbook actually refers to this as ARIES, but this is sort of the gold standard. This is, the, this is sort of the Bible, if you will, of how to do database recovery. And even though the textbook may not talk about it in terms of calling it ARIES, this is what they're doing. This is pretty much what everyone's doing. So ARIES was, was developed by, at IBM Research in the late 1980s, early 1990s by a uh, tech, uh, tech fellow at IBM called uh, Mohan. He simply goes by just, just Mohan. Uh, and it, this thing is, is this paper that we're going to talk about today is like 70 pages. It's very, very dense. It's, if you want to fall asleep and, and you need help, read this. Right? But it's also amazing. Like, I'm not trying to disparage it because it really lays down the exact steps of everything you need to do to make sure your database can recover after a crash, including all possible corner cases. So if you were building a database from scratch and said, oh, you know, how do we actually do recovery? You could turn to this. If you understood it and implement it, then you'd, be get, you'd have the guarantees that you can recover in, in, in any possible failure, other than the machine catching on fire, right? Because no algorithm or no software can do that. So, it's not to say that no database system was, was, was in the world was doing recovery before this paper came along. This thing sort of just codified the exact rules and mechanisms you had to do to ensure recovery. And so the, the various databases out there that are doing redhead logging, they may not implement ARIES exactly, right? Because there may be some variation of when you actually flush things or what metadata you actually store. But at a high level, they're essentially doing some, some variant of ARIES. So if you say your database does ARIES, everyone knows what essentially what you mean. You're doing right ahead logging with fuzzy checkpoints and can do recovery with CLRs. So that's what we're going to be focused on today. And so the, uh, as I said, the, the, the author of this paper was this guy, Mohan. He's super friendly. Uh, this is a picture of, of him and me. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. This picture of him and me a few years ago at Sigmod, just hanging out the bar. And he's a really, really nice guy. He's, and he's super fun. And the, in this picture here, he's going out to party. And the reason why you know he's going out to party, because he's got his shirt open and he's fluffed out his chest hair. So if you ever see Mohan doing that, you're looking for a good time, right? So I love Mohan a lot and this paper is great. So let's try to get through it. So Aries is going to have three main ideas. The first one is that we're going to do right ahead logging in the same way that we talked about last class, right? And we have to have this guarantee that we don't flush out any dirty uh, disk page that was modified by a transaction until the corresponding log record that modified that page has been written out the disk. And we're doing this under the Steel No Force Buffer Pool Manager policy, right? Because Steel says that we're allowed to have uh, dirty pages created by uncommitted transactions written out the disk before that transaction has been committed. And so to ensure that we can always recover and come back and figure out what was going on in that page, we have to make sure the log record for that transaction is written out first. Right? And no force just says that when a transaction commits, we don't have to flush all its dirty pages. But we have to flush all, all of its log records in order for us to say that it's completely durable and we can tell the outside world that our transaction has committed. So now the second two parts of, of ARIES is during the recovery process. So, the first thing is that during recovery, 
We're going to replay all our actions and restore the database back to the correct state. This is essentially by redoing all the actions that occurred in the log when we were running normally. Right? We're, 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 we see the redo operations and we can apply them. Then the second thing is that anytime now we do an undo, both during recovery and normal execution, we're going to log those recovery, or sorry, log those undo operations. And this is going to be really important because if we, if we crash while we're recovering, we need to recover from our recovery. And by logging all the undo records, this guarantees this. OK? So the first one should be pretty obvious, right? Because we covered that last class. The second one will become more apparent as we go along. And then the, the third one, we'll see this when we talk about CLR. So you'll, you'll understand what I mean by this, OK? And again, this is super complicated. Uh, even, you know, I'm even going at a high level of areas. I'm not going into the real nitty gritty details of the 70 page paper. Um, but it's still, it's really complex. So again, stop me and ask questions as we go along, okay? All right, cool. So today we're going to start off talking about log sequence numbers. We're going to add them to our Red Hat log uh, records so that we know in the order that we, we, we applied operations to our, our database or to our pages. And then we'll talk about what we're actually going to do now at runtime when we have a, uh, a commit and abort operations as we execute transactions. Then we're going to extend the checkpointing protocol that we talked about at the end of the last class to now talk about fuzzy checkpoints, where we're going to allow transactions to keep running while we take the checkpoint, because last class we didn't do that. And then we'll put this all together and say all the metadata we've collected from these three previous steps, we'll see how we actually can use them in our recovery algorithm. OK? All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to extend our log records from last time to now include uh, additional information. And the first thing we need to include is something called the log sequence number, or the LSM. And think of the LSM as just a logical counter that's always monotonically increasing. We're just adding one, and every time we add a new log record. And we're going to use this to ensure that the, we know the order of the operations we're applying to the database, because they'll have to match up how they apply to the log. And then various other parts of the system will use these log sequence numbers to figure out whether the log record that modified the a particular page has actually been written to disk or not. So these log sequence numbers are not just the log, you know, so the log manager and the right head log aren't the only things that know about it. Now these log sequence numbers have to permeate all throughout our entire system. So the first thing we're going to have is called the flush LSM. And we're going to record this in memory. And this is just the LSN, the last LSN that we flushed out the disk in our right head log. So we know at, at up to that LSN point, we know that everything else is, is durable prior to that. Then inside of a page now, we're going to have a page LSN and a rec LSN. The, pe the page LSN is just the last LSN of the last transaction that modified the page. And then the rec LSN is the oldest LSN that modified the page that, uh, since it was last flushed to disk. So page LSN will be, will be pretty obvious because it's like, if I have a transaction and I update a page, my, I, have my, I have an LSM for, my, for, for that update record, and then I apply it to my uh, page LSN. Or so, right? The rec LSN will make, make sense later on when we start doing recovery. The next thing is the last thing is, is the, uh, or sorry, the, the next thing is the last LSN, and this is just recording what for every transaction what was the last LSN that that it created in our right head log. And we use that to be able to jump back in, in time and just skip over other log records to find the ones that correspond to our transaction. And then the, the last one is a master record. And this is just a location on disk where we, where we record, here's the last checkpoint that I took uh, for my database. Because remember, when we take checkpoints, we add log entries for them as well. So we know where to, to jump ahead to. OK? All right, so again, every data page is going to have a page LSN. And that's going to be both when it's in memory and on disk. So it's just in the page header. So if I modify it in, in memory in my buffer pool, when I write it out, the page LSN and the rec LSN go out, go out with it. And now anytime I flush my, my, uh, my right ahead log, the tail of the log that I have in memory, I write it out to disk, I update my flushed LSN to keep track of the, the last log record I just wrote out. And again, all these log sequence numbers we're tracking always have to go forward in time. You can't go back, right? Because that would, that, would, that would mess everything up. And then when now the buffer manager wants to decide that whether it can write a page out the disk, right? Say it wants to evict a page to free space, right? Because it, it, some other page needs to come in. 
we have to check to see whether the page LSN is less than or equal to our flushed LSN. So the page LSN is, is the LSN of the last transaction that, that modified our page. And the flush LSN is the, is the last log record that we flushed out. So as long as the page LSN is less than or equal to the flush LSN, then we know every possible log record that could correspond to a change to my page has been safely written to disk. And therefore, it's safe to evict that page and write it back. Let's go through an example. All right, so the first thing we see in memory, we have our buffer pool, and we have our, the tail write head log. Right? The tail means we only need to keep track of the, you know, the last so many number of records. And then as we write them out the disk, we, we, we discard uh, those entries, and we reuse the memory. And then out on, on, on disk, we have our database, which is just, for now just a single page, and we have a write ahead log. So the first thing you see is now we're adding log sequence numbers to our log records. Again, these are always just increasing. Just think of a logical counter. You atomically update as you, as you generate each new log record. And there's going to be on, and then the, the contents of the write ahead log in memory is going to match the contents of the write ahead log on disk if they have the same format. Then we have our page LSN, and again, this is just the, the, the LSN of the last transaction that modified our page. Uh, same thing, we have it on memory on disk. The rec LSN is the oldest in-memory LSN that modified our page. And then uh, the flush LSN just corresponds to the end of the write-ahead log that's been safely written out the disk. Right? And then the master record is just a, uh, the LSN of the, of the last successful checkpoint that we took. Okay. All right. So let's say that the page LSN points to log sequence number 12. And say we want to write this page out the disk. Are we allowed to do that? What did I say in the last slide? What's, what's the criteria we have to have to say that we're, it's safe for us to write a page out the disk? Flush LSN. The page LSN has to be less than or equal to a flush LSN. So in this case here, since the page LSN is 12, the flush LSN is, is 16, so that's safe for us to write that out, so we can do that. What about this one? What if the page LSN is 19? No, right, because again, it's obvious, right? This thing is sitting in memory, so we can't flush that out. <laughs> so again, the buffer pool manager is going to use that as part of this eviction policy to decide whether it's allowed to write something out the disk. Right? This is in addition to whether something's pinned or not. Right? This is sort of all, all, all part of the same thing. Right, so again, this one, this one's not safe for us to flush. All right, so again, just to recap, all log records are going to have LSN. Every time we're going to update a page, we, we update the page LSN with the log record uh, that we just generated. So this is why you have to generate the log record first, then you apply the change, because you need to know what your LSN is first before you can apply that change. And then every single time we, we, uh, we want to flush out the log because we're running out of memory or there's a timeout, then we update the flush LSN after we've successfully written out the tail of the log, and then we can reclaim that memory. OK? All right, so these LSNs are going to be an important primitive and building block we're going to use throughout all these algorithms. Because it's going to help us figure out where we're at when, uh, in, our, in, in the recovery process for what log records we've, look at, we've looked at and what's, what's dirty, what's not dirty. So if you understand basic LSNs, then we, we can proceed and start doing more complicated things. All right, so now we want to talk about what happens when we, when we execute transactions. So again, transactions in our world are just a bunch of sequence of reads and writes. We actually ignore the reads because they don't show up in the log. It doesn't make sense to log reads, so we don't actually care. Um, so we do a bunch of operations, and then there's a commit or abort. And so for the examples we're going to show throughout this lecture, we're going to make the following four assumptions. So the, just to simplify things. All right, this is sort of what, again, if you read the ARIES paper, they cover all these things beyond what we're talking about here. So the first most obvious thing is that we're going to assume that our disk writes are atomic, and therefore all log records can fit into a single page. So we don't have to worry about some, you know, some giant update to a single record, and the, the, the log record spans two pages, and we may only get one page and not the other. We're, we're, we're going to ignore that issue. We're also going to assume that everything we're doing is on a single version database using strict two-phase locking. Right? If you understand it in the context of this environment, you can see how it can be easily extended to uh, multi-versioning or other, other concurrent digital protocols. And of course, we're going to assume that we're going to do steal and no force with write-ahead logging. Right? That's, a, that's a core principle of, of ARIES. <coughs> so when a transaction goes to commit, the, uh, you know, we, we do whatever validation we want, or it doesn't matter what concurrent protocol we're going to do. We write out a commit record to the log. 
And then we have to make sure when we write that commit record, when we flush that commit record, all log records for that transaction uh, have to come before that commit record. Right? So this assumes that we're writing them out sequentially, synchronously, out the disk. Because right? you don't want to have this transaction did two updates, and then it commits, and then I write the commit record out the disk, but before I write the, the update records. Right? I'm screwed because if I crash now before I come back, before I flush out the update records, I, I, I lost them. Right? So all the operations, all the log records for any updates have to occur, have to get written out the disk, but prior to the commit record. Now they can be written out together if they're all in the, in the same the uh, sorry, the right-head log page, they all fit in a single page. That can be done atomically, but I can't reorder them. It always has to go out sequentially. So then now, when the commit succeeds, we're going to add a new type of log record called transaction end. And this is, this is an internal bookkeeping thing for the database system. This is not exposed to the outside world. As soon as I write the commit record su successfully to disk, from an application standpoint, it, the transaction is considered committed. So we can flush this out and immediately tell the outside world, your transaction is safe, your transaction is durable. <coughs> right? This transaction end thing will come up later on, because this is just internal for us to say, we've done everything we needed to do for this transaction, so any internal bookkeeping we're doing about this transaction, we can throw away. Right? And this thing doesn't need to be flushed out immediately. The commit does. Right? If you want your transaction to be truly durable before we tell you are your transaction committed, we have to flush this thing. This thing, again, is internal. We'll flush it out just you know, as, as it goes along eventually. OK? Again, this will come up later on when we do aborts. For, so for committing a transaction, it's pretty straightforward. Right? I commit. That's flushed. I'm done. Now I can write transaction end. And then that eventually gets, gets written out. So let's look at an example. Right? So again, we have our transaction here. It's uh, doing two updates. We have our commit record. Now at this point, we have to flush out the log. Right? So we take everything that's in memory. Everything that comes before this, this commit record has to be written out. Once that's now durable on disk, uh, then we can update the flush LSN to say now it's now uh, log record 15. Right? Then at some point, we do later processing. Doesn't matter what we're doing. Uh, but we'll add our transaction end record, and then at this point here, we know that everything about this transaction is 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 done. We'll never see any update ever again, right? So we just we just discard anything we we know about it. We also can discard at this point too, right? After we do this uh, flush on the on the commit record here, we know it's out on disk. So for all intents and purposes, we can just we can just remove it out of memory because we don't we're never going to need to go back and use it, right? If we ever needed it because we crashed, right? having it in memory doesn't help us because the memory's going to get blown away after the crash. And it's out on disk safely, so we can go out and get it. So we can reclaim that memory and reuse it. Yes? Uh, who keeps track of the LSN? So he says, who keeps track of the LSN? Which LSN? Sorry, there's a ton of them. Um, so, like, uh, so if you have concurrent, if you can have a like, concurrent transaction, then you can use the meeting uh, uh, transaction. Mm-hmm. So this question is, who's generating these LSNs and the log records? Yeah. So it's like the log manager. You go to the log manager and say, here's, here's my update information, right? That, or here's the, here's the update information that, I, that I'm, I want to apply to the database. It says, OK, I got it. And by the way, here's your log sequence number. And internally, the log manager just has a counter incrementing one by one. So in this example here, I only have one transaction. So you know, 0, 12, 13, 14, 15. Right, these are all log sequence numbers going in in that order for that one transaction. But I can interleave them with other transactions. Right? So, so transaction T4 might have 12, but transaction T5 might have 13. I don't care. And it is possible that the, the transaction is still running, but part of the Red Hat log is collected to this. Yeah, so he is, excellent point. So he says, it may be the case that a transaction is still running. We haven't committed yet, but a portion of its log of its log has been written out the disk because it got piggybacked on some other log write. Absolutely, yes, right, and that's fine, right? Because if we come, if, if we crash, if we abort that transaction, we're gonna we're gonna log our aborts anyway, so we'd have to write out all the changes anyway. So this is a good point. It's actually the in the next slide for our aborts. Just because a transaction aborted doesn't mean we can discard its write ahead log records, right? We want to log everything, even for the transactions that are that are aborted, right? And so the way to think about this, the 
aborting a transaction at runtime is going to basically be the same thing we do during recovery to undo a transaction. It's all the same steps. And so this is going to be different than what I've talked about before when we talked about undo. Because when we talked about undo before, I've been really vague. I just said, yeah, there's some in-memory state, and you just roll that back and whatever, right? Now we need to be very explicit. And what we're going to do when we undo a transaction, we're actually now going to add new log records for the, all, when we reverse those changes. So the first thing we need to do is figure out, keep track of how we can go back and undo the, 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 the operations of a transaction. So we're now we're going to add a new field to our log record called the previous LSN. And this is going to be on a per transaction basis, the pre, the, 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 for each log record, the LSN of the previous log record for that individual transaction. Because that may, again, we may be interleaving other transactions, so it may not be always in sequential order. We want to know how to jump ahead and say, where's, the, uh, where's that log record we need to undo next? And essentially, just, this is, again, think, think of this as a linked list. We don't need this for correctness. We need this for performance, right? Because we don't want this to do a sequential scan on a, on a huge log just to find the next one we want to undo. We know how to jump and find what we want. Right, so we go back to our, our entry here. Uh, again, if now we're in our, in our header of each log record. We prefix it with the LSN and the previous LSN. And then say that this transaction aborts. Uh, we, we now need to figure out how to undo its changes. Right, so this transaction did two updates. Is we need to figure out in this middle part here, how do we undo its changes and, and, and keep track of that log? Because what we don't want is we don't want to we need to know that we're applying changes to reverse some other change we, we've made because we don't know whether that other change has been written out to disk yet. We don't know the, if the original change has been written out to disk yet. So we're going to introduce a new type of log record called the compensation log record, or the CLR. And this is just like an update record, but it's explicitly telling you that I'm undoing a previous update record. All right? And so it's going to have all the same fields as an update record, like the before value and the after value. Uh, but now we're going to have a new one called undo next. It just tells us the next one we need to undo in, in our list. So we're going to add these as we undo the changes of a transaction, just as we would doing, during an update. But we know the transaction is in, is in this special abort mode. So now I'm going to show a different sort of example or, or, or illustration of what the logs will look like, because we're, we're, we're adding a lot of fields and we're running out of space. So we have a transaction T1. Uh, it begins, and we have a log sequence number for that, a log record for that, and then it does an update on A. Then some other stuff happens, and then some later point we get an abort operation. So this is what we've seen so far in our, in our write ahead log in memory. And now we need to go back and undo this. So the first thing we, we would recognize is that we have to undo this update operation we did before. So we're going to append a new compensation log record that says, I'm undoing this, this change here, right? All right? So some internal metadata to say, oh, I know I'm undoing uh, log sequence number 02. Then the before and after value, again, are just the reverse of what we did before. So it used to be 30. And when we did the update the first time, I went from 30 to 40. Now if I'm undoing, I'm going to 40 to 30. We're right? just putting this back where we were before. And then we have the undo next. It's just a pointer to say, what's the next What's the next log record we, for this transaction we need to undo? Right? And for this one here, it points back to the, the, the begin log record, and its previous LSN is, is nil or null. So we know we don't need to look at anything else prior to this. Right? So at this point, we've, undo, we've we reversed all the changes of the transaction. Right? But now we need to put a log record in there that says we've undone everything we needed to do to, to truly abort this transaction. We can't put commit, because that makes it look like the transaction actually succeeded. Right? So this is, this is where transaction end comes in. Right? This is, this is why we have we, this additional log record type. We add transaction end. We said, we've undone everything you needed to do for this transaction. And we can blow away any internal state we're maintaining for it. Now, when a transaction aborts, right, either because the user told us to abort or the data system aborted you, right, like at this point here, we tell the outside world your transaction's aborted. Right? It's OK. Because the, it doesn't actually care. The, the application doesn't care that like, I've undone all my changes and written log records out the disk. 
to, to know that I fully aborted. I just told him I'm aborted, and the day system will make sure that, that you don't come back and try to read, read anything. That should have been aborted. So that's sort of clear. So when you commit, I can't commit until I flush all the log records. Uh, if, and, and for I abort, I can actually tell the, the application, yes, you're aborted, before I even flush this log record out. Because it doesn't matter. So yes? Right, so he said, if I'm redoing a transaction during recovery, I'm going forward. If I'm, doing, if I'm going to undo a transaction, I'm going reverse direction. Yes, that'll be the recovery mechanism we use later. Yes? Say it again, why do we start with 001? Yeah. So, all right, so, so, so we're here, we start here. All right, we, we have to abort this transaction. So the, the first, the, 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 the newest update that this transaction did, there's only one, but the newest update is 002. So that's the one we want to reverse first, right? And this is just saying, okay, well, if it's, it's, this matches up with this and say, if you undo this thing, right, if you undo 002 in this, this here, then the next one you want to undo is 001. Because at this point, you don't know what 001 is. It's just telling you, hey, where to go, go look at it. So then when we do our lookup in 001, we would see that, oh, it's the begin transaction. There's no other update that comes after this. So we know we have, we've done, undone everything this transaction did when it ran the first time. So it's, now we can write our transaction end. Is that clear? All right, cool. All right, so again, when you do an abort, you first have to abort, write the log record. And then you're going to play back in reverse order all the updates that the transaction uh, applied when it ran. Um, and you're going to first write a CLR entry to say, here's the reverse of the operation for that particular update. Then you restore the old value. And you keep doing that into the chain until you get back to the begin of the transaction. And at that point, you've undone everything the transaction did. And then now you can write out the transaction end. So CLRs are never going to be uh, never going to be undone because they're essentially looking like uh, they're they, they are essentially like updates, but they're logically tied to a to to a, an update from before. And it's an additional metadata we can keep track of if we want to uh, not update. Um, yeah, you, you'll never generate a CLR for the same update multiple times because you know what your update what the CLR corresponds to. And so when you when when we later on when we talk about recovery, we'll see that we can we can replay transactions and apply these CLRs, and we never have to undo them because this is occurring after we've known the transaction aborted. All right, so we covered log sequence numbers. We've we've, we've covered the uh, CLRs. And now we can start getting more complicated and talk about how to take checkpoints. Because again, the idea of a checkpoint is that the, the log is going to run forever, or it's going to grow forever. And so if we had to uh, replay the entire log every single time we restarted, that could take a long time. So the checkpoints are a way to say, to, to, to tell the log record, all your pages that were in your buffer pool at this point in time have been written out the disk. And therefore, I don't need to go start at the beginning of the log. I can start at that point there in, in, the, in the database, or in the log. So let's talk about two ways to do checkpoints that are bad. And then we'll see how to do the better way, uh, which is the fuzzy checkpoints. So the, the easiest way to take a checkpoint. Again, we want our checkpoint to essentially be a consistent snapshot. That sort of could be one goal. The easiest way to do this is you halt you, you stop ac accepting any new transaction, and you let whatever transactions that are currently running right now, you let them finish. Then at some point, there'll be no active transactions in your system. Then you just scan through your buffer pool and write out your checkpoint. Right? Super easy, super bad, right? Because you could have a transaction that could, could be running for hours. 
and I'm, I, I need to wait until it, it finishes, I'm not accepting any new transactions. So my database system look like, looks like it's going to be down or it's unresponsive during, during this, you know, waiting for this one transaction to finish. And I don't know how long it's going to take because it could be issuing transaction requests or query requests over and over again. So again, this is bad. This is, this is easy for us to implement, but in, in, in practicality of it is, is not good because again, it'll make our database look unresponsive. So the slightly better technique is what I talked about last time, but still not that good, um, where we'll, we'll just let any, we, we, we don't have to stop any, accepting any new transactions. We'll just pause any active transactions while they're running, while we take the checkpoint, and then once the checkpoint's done, they can resume and start up again. So what this would look like from the application standpoint, it'll look like your query is just taking, you know, it just took a little bit longer than, than you, maybe you expected, because it paused it while I was writing things out. So the issue that we have to deal with, though, is that this is going to have inconsistent checkpoints, because we may not get all the updates of, of a transaction that may have been active at the moment we took the checkpoint. So let's say that we have three pages in memory, and then we have one thread that went through a checkpoint, one thread wants to do a transaction. So say the transaction is already running first, and it's going to update two pages. It's going to update page three and update page one. Right? It's going to go in sort of reverse order. So say at the, at the beginning, it up, updates page three. Then now we pause all our transactions, because we're going to take the checkpoint, and the checkpoint goes ahead and scans through and writes out the, the pages to disk. So it's going to get one and two as they existed before transaction, the transaction started, but then it's going to get page three with the modification that the transaction made before the checkpoint started. We write that out the disk, now we, we unpause all our transactions, then this, the transaction keeps going and now updates page one. So now in disk we have, again, we have, we have the, the state of page one and two before the transaction started, but page three after the transaction started. But if you want a consistent snapshot, you, you need the update to page one as well. Right? right? The issue for this is because there's no extra information we have in our checkpoint about what was going on in the state of the system. For, my, for this sort of simple example, all we did is say, let's just pause everybody and we'll, we'll, we'll you know, write out a checkpoint and then they can come back and do whatever they want. So to be able to recognize these, these issues, to recognize that, oh, we actually missed page one from this transaction, we need to actually store some additional metadata about the, what was going on in the system at the time we took the checkpoint. And now we're actually going to keep track of the boundaries of the time we were taking the checkpoint. So before I just said, I take a checkpoint, I pause everybody, and it's a single log entry for that. Now I want to say, I start my checkpoint and, I'm a, and I end my checkpoint. So now what we're going to record in, in our checkpoints are something called the active transaction table, or the ATT. So these are all the transactions that were active at the time the checkpoint was running. And then we'll have the dirty page table of the pages that were modified since I started my checkpoint. And that'll help me figure out, oh, by the way, there's this transaction here, and they were active when I was running, and they modified this page, so I missed that. So the active transaction table was going to be this internal memory uh, hash table, or table, that doesn't have to get written out to disk, except when it goes written out with checkpoints. And it's going to, for every single transaction that's active during the checkpoint, we're going to keep track of its transaction ID, its status, whether it's running, committing, or a candidate for undo, meaning we don't know what, we don't know what its outcome is going to be, so we think we're, we're going to have to undo it. And then we're also going to have the LSN for the most recent uh, log record that was created by this transaction. Now, any time a transaction commits or aborts, we can remove it from our, our, our ATT. The dirty page table is going to keep track of what pages in the buffer pool uh, at the point I'm taking the checkpoint, and which one of them were modified, uh, or the log record of the, of the, of the, for the transaction that modified them. So for every entry of a dirty page in the dirty page table, we have the rec LSN, which is the oldest, record, oldest log record for any active transaction that calls this page to get dirty, right? We have the difference between the page LSN and the rec LSN. Page LSN is the newest log record for the transaction that made, for a transaction that made the page dirty, and the rec LSN is the oldest one. So that's where this comes into play. So let's look at an example. So we're running, running out of our space in our log, but well, that's fine. All right, so the, in this example here, we're gonna have two checkpoints. 
at the first time we take the checkpoint, we're going to see that in our active transaction table, T2 is still active, right? Because the begins up here, right? And then we have two dirty pages, right? We have P P11 and P22 because P11 and P22 were modified here, right? We don't know whether they, they you know, they'll be written out the disk yet. So then now when we take a, another checkpoint, at this point, uh, our active transaction table only contains T3, because during this time since then, T2 committed. So T3 is active during this, this checkpoint, right? Because we paused it while we were running. So we keep track of that there. And then our dirty pages is P11, P P33, because these guys were modified up here since the last checkpoint, right? So this is better because now we, we, we know if we have that torn update problem where the transaction updates two pages and we wrote out one but not the other, we will we'll be able to see that because we know what pages are being are dirty and what active transactions are, are, are running. But this is still not ideal because we still have to pause all our transactions while we did this. Right? And again, depending on how big our buffer pool is, how many dirty pages we have, how fast our disk is, this might be you know, a couple minutes while we write everything out. Right? If you have like a you know, one terabyte buffer pool, this could take a long time. So the way to get around of not having to pause transactions is to do what's called a fuzzy checkpoints. So this is where we're going to still, we're going to take active checkpoints, or so we're going to take a checkpoint, but we're going to let transactions keep on running while we take the checkpoints and still update the database, and then we're going to rely on the ATT and the DPT to be able to figure out what pages were modified during this time. So now we're going to introduce two types of new log records called checkpoint begin, checkpoint end. Checkpoint begin just says, here's the start of my checkpoint. I start doing my sequential scan on my buffer pool in memory, and I start writing, writing those pages out to disk. And the checkpoint end you, is where you say, all right, I've done my checkpoint, and oh, by the way, here's now the ATT and the DPT for things that were running or active and modified pages while I took the checkpoint. And I may or may not have written out those pages out to disk. You, you don't know. So if we go back to our example here, uh, now we see that we have, again, we have a checkpoint begin and we have a checkpoint end. So in the checkpoint begin, right, when this occurs, we actually go and update our master record on disk to say, here's the, check, here's the last checkpoint I took for, for, my, for, my, for my database. <laughs> right, so then when we crash, we can come back to that and figure out whether we actually got everything we wanted. Now, maybe the case, the checkpoint actually doesn't complete because we crash before, before it finishes, and, but we would know that because we would scan forward and not see the checkpoint end. But for our purposes, let's keep it simple. Assume our, we're not going to crash during checkpoints. So then we see now we, in our checkpoint end entry, we have, again, the ATT and the DPT. So at this point here in the ATT, the only active transaction that was running at the moment our checkpoint started was T2, right? Because T1 committed here, T2 began here, T3 started after the last checkpoint, but I don't care. Because, again, the, when I do recovery, I'm, my starting point is going to be checkpoint begin. So I'll scan forward in the log and see T3 get started. But I need to know T, about T2, because I'm may not, you know, i I'm not starting at that point in the log. I need to know, oh, by the way, above my checkpoint begin, there's a transaction T2 that you need to know about. And then for the dirty page table, so to keep it simple, we say during, in, in between during the checkpoint, we wrote uh, transaction T2 updated page 11. Uh, so we just have that in our dirty page table. And it doesn't mean that it was, it doesn't mean that it was, was exactly, it was or was not written out the disk during the checkpoint. It's just saying it was modified during this time. It may not have been. All right, so now, now with, the, the, now with fuzzy checkpoints, log sequence numbers, and CLRs, now we can actually do recovery. So Aries is going to have three phases. The first phase is, 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 is doing analysis, and this is where we're going to read the log going forward in time from the, the, the last checkpoint that was successful, and we're going to figure out what are all the, the transactions that were running during this time, whether they've committed or not, and uh, how far back we actually need to go in the log beyond the checkpoint. Because we can look at the active transaction table and say, well, there's a, there's a, active tra there's a transaction that started above where the checkpoint started, so you, you need to know about it. So you scan through once to do analysis. 
Then you're going to go back and do scan through again to do redo. And where you start to do the redo may actually be after the last checkpoint. Because you would use the actual transaction table to tell you this. And you're going to replay all the log entries until the very end in the redo phase. Even if you know the transaction is going to go into abort, because you would see it, it's going to abort in the analysis phase. You don't care. We're going to replay everything. Then now, after we finish the, all those redo, now essentially where we're at is the state of the database is exactly as it was at the moment that it crashed, including all uh, you know, act, transactions that were actively running but then ended up aborting. So then in the final phase, you go back now in reverse order, and you're going to undo all the, transaction, the changes from transactions that you know didn't commit before you crashed, before the log got finished. And then once that's done, then you know the, the database is in the exact state that it should have been at the moment of the crash without any partial updates or partial transactions. It only contains the, the changes from transactions that successfully committed uh, before the crash. So is that clear? So, yes? So if you want to redo everything, including the CLR record, why do you even have to have a backward in the CLR record? This question is, if you want to redo everything, uh, if you want to redo everything, including the CL, CLR records, why do you need to have a backward link? Because if I'm undoing a transaction, uh, I say I have two updates. I need to uh, undo them. So I have the first CLR for the first, first update I reversed. Then before I get now to the second one, I crash. So there's no second CLR. So when I come back, I'm going to redo that and, and keep going where I left off. I want to know where to jump next. So you don't need it for correctness. This, so a bunch of those extra uh, those LSN pointers are just to jump more quickly to where you want to go. Yeah, but like so when you're playing the CLR, you're actually creating a forward manner. Statement is, if you're playing the CLR, you're still in a forward manner. Um, for recovery, yes. For, uh, for, for like the runtime process, no. Because right, you're going in reverse order for that. So you don't need it for the, for the redo, but you need it for the, the runtime operation. Yes? You see, if you still need to undo, sorry, say it again? Yeah. Uh, I, th th I think you're saying that if you know you have to undo them in, the, in phase three, why even bother with redoing them in phase two? Um, this is for just they're being super anal about correctness, right? So there's a bunch of optimizations you can do. Say, oh, I know I'm not. For example, I know this transaction is going to abort because I saw this. I saw it didn't commit in the analysis phase, and I know that it only modified a page that no other transaction will modify. So as long as my page on disk at the start of the redo phase is where it should be. And not any changes, with not with any changes um, from this transaction. I know that's going to abort later on. Then I can just ignore everything that transaction does because it never made it out the disk. I don't care. So there's, yes, there's a ton of optimizations you can do like this. We're not going to do any of them because we just want to understand the basics of this. And I'm saying that like to understand how to get database recovery, like it's this is super important because you don't want to lose any data. So we're going to be super cautious, overly conservative, and make sure the database is exactly the state it should be. Even though we know there's some things we could throw away, we're not going to do any of that. All right, so visually, it's going to look like this. So, again, starting from the last begin checkpoint we have that we found via our master record, right, that's going to tell us where in the log we want to start. And we do our analysis phase, go forward in time, and just build out the, the ATT and the DPT, right? Then we go look at the, the, in the redo phase, we're going to jump to some other point in the log, which may or may not be before the, the checkpoint, and we're going to replay all those changes for every transaction. Even for ones that possibly the pages actually made it out the disk, we don't care. You know, since the checkpoint, we don't care. We're going to replay everything because we don't want to miss anything. Then we're going to do our undo. We have to go back in time and undo the, uh, the effects of any failed transaction, any transaction that didn't commit at, by the end of the log. Okay? 
And again, I'm showing you that this, these are sort of like the max bounds of how far you'd have to maybe go back and look at each of these things, right? So maybe the case that there's no transaction that, that you have to undo past the last checkpoint. But there could have been a transaction that was, you know, you opened five days ago, right, and it's just sitting open and made a bunch of changes that you have to go back and reverse. Now, again, the key is that you don't have to redo everything to get back up there, but you have to undo it. Okay? All right, so we'll go through these one by one. So the, the idea of the, the analysis phase is the goal is that we want to basically reestablish the knowledge of the internal state of the database in regard to the DPT and the ATT at the moment that, that we crashed. So we're going to jump to the last successful checkpoint, scan forward, and, and look at every single log record. So anytime we find a transaction end record, then we go ahead and remove it from the ATT because we don't, need to, we don't care about it anymore. Right? There's nothing else that's going to come after it later on. For all, all the records we see, uh, if the log record corresponds to a transaction that we haven't seen before, then we need to, uh, we need to add it to our ATT. Um, but we're going to set its state to be uh, a candidate for undo. Because at that point, it's the first time we've ever seen this transaction. We haven't looked it down the rest of the log, so we don't know what's going to come, come later on. So we think it's probably going to have to abort. Or we're going to assume that it's going to have to abort. But then if we see a commit record, then we can flip its status to be commit, because we know it, it has successfully finished prior to the crash, before the crash. If we see any update record, then we're going to know what page it modified. So if the page is not in our dirty page table, we're going to go ahead and add it, and then we're going to set the rec LSN for that page to be our LSN for, the, for, for our log record. And again, so now the way to think about this is like we're keeping track of the, all the pages that were modified since, since from the last checkpoint to the crash. Some of them may have been written out the disk. Some of them may not have been. We don't know at this point. So that's why we're just building this internal metadata to keep track of what we think should have happened. So now at the end of the analysis phase, we have in our ATT, it tells us what are the transactions that were active at the time of the crash. And it tells us, uh, the DPT tells us, what are the dirty pages that may or may not have been written out the disk before the crash. So let's look at an example. So here we have now uh, a simple Red Hat log. And then this is this, the internal state we're building up as we, as, as we do our analysis. So in the first, you know, we jump to the, to our, our, the first checkpoint begin. Right? There's nothing to, to record for this point right? in our ATT or DPT. Right? We don't know anything yet. Then we get to now to this first update record here as 020. So in our active transaction table, we're going to add an entry to say transaction 96, and we set its status to be uh, undo, uh, undo candidate because again, at this point, we don't know anything else that comes down the log, right? We're scanning this for the first time. So we think it's going to have to get aborted and undo everything. They're also going to record that it modified page 33. So we have an entry in our dirty page table to say page 33 has been modified. And the oldest log record that modified it is 20. Then now we get to the checkpoint begin, sorry, the checkpoint end. And now we have a bunch of additional metadata that we can record about what were the active transactions we had at the time and what are some of the other dirty pages we had at the time. So here it's point out is I knew about transaction 96 since my last checkpoint, since the checkpoint began, because I saw an update record for that. But I also have transaction 97 here, right? So I, I didn't see any, any update record from this transaction because it's up, whatever it did, it's up above this checkpoint begin. Right, so this is what the ATT is telling us. That, hey, by the way, there's another transaction you need to know about, it, but it did something before you did your checkpoint. It also modified page 20. So again, same thing, we have an entry for that, and it has some uh, log sequence number that comes before us. Then now we do our commit, and now here transaction 96 is going to commit. So now we change our status in the ATT, for, for transaction 96 to be committed, right? And then what, we can ignore the, the dirty page table for this because we're not flushing anything out, right? We, we only have to flush the log record. Then we have the transaction end, and now at this point we know that all the changes that for this transaction have uh, been successfully written out, so we can go ahead and just remove that here, right? So now at the analysis phase, we go to the redo phase. Again, the idea here is we're going to replay all the entries, of the, all the log records we have in our log, both for uh, the updates and the, the reversals with the CLRs. And 
we're going to reply all our changes. And we're going to do this for even the transactions that abort. Yes? Uh, her question is, if we remove uh, T96 here, why do we still have to maintain uh, information about this page table here, in th those pages? Um, so this is just telling us that this, trans that this transaction was active, or whether it's finished or not. This, we don't know anything about whether these pages have been written out to disk or not. They're independent of each other. Right? But it modifies some pages, right? Were those pages written out to disk? You don't know. Right? I still keep track of, like, oh, for, for you know, say it modified, what, 20? So I know for, for modified page P33, I know P, page P33 was modified. And the, the first log record that, that made that change was 20. So I know if I come back, and, I, and I'm going to replay this, I know I need to see at least whatever this log record was. Because I don't know, right, I, I don't know whether that modification made it out the disk or not. Yes? Is it true that the DPT will always increase? Her, her question is, is it true that the DPT always increases? During the analysis phase, yes. Right, as we flush things out, we can remove them. OK, so now, again, the redo phase, we're, gonna repeat, we're basically repeating the history to put us back at, at, in the exact state we were in in our database system at the moment of the crash. Right? So again, we're going to replay, re, replay everything, even for border transactions, because again, we want to we be exact about this. So, as I said to her before, when she asked about, well, why do, I have to re why do I have to redo transactions that I know are going to abort later on? Again, there are techniques to avoid these things. We're, we're going to ignore all that for now. OK? All right, so what's going to happen is we're going to scan forward in our log from the, 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 the entry in the dirty page table with the smallest rec LSN. Again, the rec LSN is the oldest LSN corresponding to an update to a page that, that made it dirty. So we've got to go back in our log and find that, that log record. And then, because we know that anything prior, anything that comes before that, all those pages have been written out the disk. Right? Because my rec letter, my, my LSN is, 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 the, is the oldest one. So we're going to scan forward now and replay all the log records that come after this. And then for every single update log record we, or CLR we see, we're going to reapply our change to the database unless one of the three criteria are met. So if the affected page is not in the DPT, then we know that it got written out the disk, so we're fine. Or if the affected page is in the DPT, but it's the log records LSN is greater than the, 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 the rec LSN, then we know it's also been written out in the disk as well. Or if we go bring the page in and we see its page LSN, again, the newest, the, the LSN of the, the, the newest log record that modified it, if that is greater than our log record's LSN, then we know that whatever modification that our log record had to that page was written out the disk because it got, it got later written out by when this thing got flushed out. Again, we can use these LSNs to figure out what's actually being written, what's the order of these things happening. Yes? Within the second curve here, we have all these values to choose. Effective page is in the DPT, but that record's LSN is greater than the smallest record of LSN. <coughs> um, yeah, actually, this should be, the, I think, the, this should be the page LSN. Right? Like, yeah, that, that, should, be, that should, be the, should be the page. So. I have, my, I have my, my log record. I have a rec LSN that corresponds to it uh, when it was last, last modified. But then my LSN comes after this. Yeah, it should be the other way. My rec LSN comes, comes, the rec LSN is on disk is newer than my LSN 
then again, I know I, all my changes got written. It's, it's the opposite of this. Okay, yeah, I, I'll fix that afterwards. Again, the reason why we're starting here because we know everything else prior to this in our log, all the changes that made to the pages have been successfully written out the disk. Yes? Okay, so I have, I, so I'm, I'm going through my log. I have an LSN here for my log record. I, I'm looking at a page, and it's rec LSN comes after mine, after my log record. Then I know in order for anything to get written out for that page, it has to, has to have, all any changes that came before it has to been applied to it. So everything else up to that point has been written out, so I don't need to reapply it. Yes, because okay. because so yeah, I should be very clear here. So, at this point, I'm going through. I have nothing in memory. Yeah. If I have no I know pages in memory, I don't know anything about it. So I bring the page in memory and I say, aha, I have a page LSN and a and a, and a rec LSN. Now I look at all the log records I want to reapply and I see whether mine my change occurs after that thing was last written out the disk. Yeah. I, I should rewrite that to make it more clear. Correct, yes. Because whatever changes you have were not applied to it. Yeah. You actually, at this point, you know it not. Because you, you fetched it from disk. You know. All right, so to redo an action, all we have to do is just reapply the, law, the action again, update the page LSN to be whatever our LSN was for our, our, our change. And then that's it. We don't have to do any additional logging. We don't have to do any, any additional forcing of flushes, right? Because it's just, it's just almost the same thing we were doing at runtime. Re, re, instead of running SQL queries, we're replaying these, these, uh, these log records. So now, at the end of the redo phase, for any transaction that is still in, uh, in our, in any transaction in the DPT with the commit status, we can go ahead and add uh, its, uh, T transaction end entry, if we hadn't seen it, right? We actually, if it's still in the DBT, then we didn't see the transaction end. So we can go ahead and add it, right? And then remove it from the ATT. Right? This is saying we saw a transaction that committed, but we didn't see the transaction end entry before we crashed. But we know it actually committed because we saw the commit entry. So we can go ahead and remove it. But now for the undo phase, any transactions that are still in the DBT, sorry, in the ATT, with the status of undo candidate, those are the ones we need to reverse and undo. So now what we're going to do is, again, we're going to go in reverse order, and we're going to process the, the, the each log record and undo them um, in, in the opposite order that they appear, right, from, from the real, real wall clock time. And then every single time we, uh, we undo an entry, we're going to add a CLR, because it's going to be the same process you would have at runtime when you aborted the transaction. Okay, so that's the full full end end example of this, right? So we'll do a really simple, uh, uh, really simple log log here. Um, what's sort of not shown is that these previous LSNs the allows the bounce through for every single transaction, but we can ignore that for now. I'm trying to make it this as compact as possible because there's a lot to cover. But let's say here after log sequence 60 we crash, so now we need to recover the database after this. So say we go through now our analysis phase, and we do our analysis phase, and we update our ATT, and we see that we have two entries here for transactions that uh, did, not, did not finish before we crashed. So then when we go to the redo phase for, 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 uh, for T1, we, we already have actually the transaction end entry here, right? So there's no changes we actually have to make, right? So now, the first thing I'm going to do is now go back in reverse order. So the first thing I'm going to do is undo this change that T2 made on this page here. So in our CLR, we're going to say we're doing undo for transaction T2, and reverse, we're reversing the, the operation that occurred in, uh, at, at LSN 60. 
And then we have now just a pointer in our undo next to say, here's the next operation I need to undo for this particular transaction. It's not the next operation I'm going to physically apply. It's just for this particular transaction, it's the next one I, I should apply. Again, we don't need this for correctness. We'll need this if we crash during recovery, right? So we crashed and recovering, and now we're going to crash again during recovery. We want to know how to jump ahead and find the, thing, the next thing we actually should reverse. So let's say now the next thing we do is the undo, the update on T3. Same thing, on update undo T3, and the log sequence number this corresponds to is 50. And at this point here, we know that there's no other update for T3 in this transaction. So we can go ahead and, and put a t transaction end message in there to say that it's, it's fully done and fully committed. So now the next thing we need to undo is this one here on T2. But let's say I, here, you flush the log and now everything, everything's out to disk. So now say before we, update, before we undo the second update on T2, we go ahead and crash and restart. So now our ATT and DPT that we generated from the analysis phase is blown away. So now when we come back, we're going to do our, again, same thing, do our analysis, then do our redo, and now we've got to figure out which ones we actually need to undo. So the only transaction that's still sitting around in the ATT after we've done this analysis here is transaction T2, because it has, uh, you know, it had this undo record here, but we didn't undo the other one. So now this is where the, those undo LSN pointers, or next, undo next LSN pointers help us, because now instead of having to scan and look at through every single log record, we know that we only need to look at the, the log records for this one transaction. So we can just use this as a linked list to jump through and find the entries that we want. Right, this seems sort of trivial because I'm only showing a small number of log records. But again, think of like, you know, a database system doing a million transactions a second. And so you, you're going to have these, these really log, log, large logs. And you don't want to have to scan and look at everything because reading from disk is expensive. So this allows you to jump through more quickly. So at this point here, again, I recognize that when I tried to start undoing this transaction, I, as I redid, redid it the first time, I would see, all right, well, I, I was able to undo this entry here. The next one I need to undo is up here in 20. So I would add the, the next CLR for that, up, reverse the change. That's the only one I have left for this transaction T2. And then I write out the transaction end message and I flush that. So now at this point here, when I do this, when I finish this one here, I, I've covered all the transactions I have in my actual transaction table. I don't have to flush out the, the dirty page table because that'll happen again when, in, the, in the normal process as I execute new transactions. But at this point here, if I've, if I've reversed all transactions that were still sitting in the ATT, then recovery is done. And now I can turn the system on or it, it, I can sort of start listening on connections and start accepting new requests and new transactions. I'm going back into normal mode. Is everyone falling asleep or is everyone dying? Right, this is hard, right? This is, this is, this is why you don't want to write recovery for yourself in your, in your shitty application, right? You want to use a database system because it's people, are gonna, you know, really smart people will spend a lot of time making sure that this works correctly and the average JavaScript programmer is not going to be able to do this. <laughs> um, right? This is why database developers get paid a lot of money because Nobody wants to lose data, so you pay people that know what the hell they're doing to make sure you don't lose data, all right? Okay. So, yes? Can we say that the CLR records will never be played backwards? His statement is, the CL will the CLR never be played backwards? I mean, do you un... I mean, there are just uh, like two legal operations for CLR. The first thing is like when you're constructing a CLR, you're playing back the original record. Yes. The second option is like you get a CLR, you took the previous LSN and jump to the... Correct, yeah, so, so to be more concretely, you don't undo an undo. Okay. Right, so you don't, you, you do, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't undo a CLR. Yeah. So when I'm doing, so I, I, I would replay them, say I crashed here. On recovery, I would replay the CLR and apply all the changes, but then recognize, oh, I don't see a transaction end message for T2. So what was the last... What was the last LSN I saw for it? 70. So I know this is, I'm, I'm in the undo phase here, so I use undo next to tell me where to jump through, right? And then again, you're using pointers to say, all right, well, this thing updated, this thing reversed 60, 
So the next thing I need to undo is 20. And then I add the CLR for that. So you only redo and undo. But no undo and undo. You, correct. So he said you only redo undo. You never undo undo. Yes. All right. Yes. I'm just, so I'm just saying that like, yeah, so his statement is, why am I showing this sort of chain here, right? Why can't you just use this and jump to that? Yes, I'm just, I'm saying that this thing corresponds to this, and I, I know the lineage of what things I need to look at. Okay. All right, so we talked about what happens if you crash during undo. What happens if you crash during the analysis phase? What do you have to do? Anything special? No, right? Because you didn't do anything, right? You didn't, you didn't write anything out. You don't do anything. You just run the run analysis again. What if you crash during redo? Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. Yes, because I'm going to come back and just redo everything all over again and pick up where I left off, right? So it's sort of only in the undo phase you need to be a little bit careful about recognizing I've undo I've undone this transaction so far and I need to figure out how to jump back and undo the rest of it. All right, so. This came up a couple of times. It seems like we're, we're going to be kind of slow when we're doing this because we're, we're doing maybe more work than we actually need to. So what's one way we can improve performance during the redo phase? So what I didn't really talk about is that we were, we're actually going to be super anal and like flush everything as we go along. But if you assume you're not going to crash during, during the redo phase, then you just flush your changes out the disk asynchronously and just keep going. Right, because again, if I crash while I'm doing this, I'm going to redo everything anyway, so who cares? So I, maybe I'm not so super careful about making sure everything gets flushed. When I'm done, I've got to make sure everything's flushed, but not, not while I'm doing it. What about the undo phase? So one optimization you could do, other than not undoing things that you, don't, you know you don't need to undo, or, or yeah, undoing things that you shouldn't have redone in the first place. Um, you actually can lazily apply undo, undo operations only when transactions actually go to try to read them. So there's a the paper from Gertz Graffy, the guy that did the volcano stuff uh, that we talked about before. He has a technique where you basically keep track of, oh, I have a page, but I haven't applied all the changes to put it back into the correct form. And if anybody tries to go read it, then I'll go ahead and do that. So that way you can turn the database on right away and it's almost like it instantly gets recovered, even though underneath the covers it actually didn't. The alternative also too is just to rewrite your application to make sure you don't have any really, really long transactions. Because that'll reduce the amount of, amount of how far you, you have to go back in the log. But that, again, that requires a major rewrite. All right, so to finish up, the, uh, the main ideas of Aries, again, right ahead logging with steel no force. Uh, we're gonna use fuzzy checkpoints. You know, take snapshots of all the dirty pages and maintain the, the ATT and DPT about what was going on in the system at, at the time we did this. Um, we're gonna, when, during the recovery operation, one pass to do analysis, figure out what was going on, redo, uh, pass to go to do redo, and we apply all the changes since the, the last page we know that was, was not possibly written out the disk. And then we undo for any transactions at the end that we know that it didn't have commit to reverse all their changes. Right? And as we're doing undos, we make sure we log everything in CLRs. So the, the log sequence numbers are essentially a, the, what we're going to use to figure out what the hell's going on in the system. Right? It's going to basically link these things together to keep, keep, keep track of, for my transaction, here's all the log records I generated. So if I need to do anything for a transaction, like undo, to undo it, I know how to jump over to the log records that are, that are in between those log records and jump to the ones I just need for that single transaction. Okay? And the page LSN and rec LSN allows us to figure out what's out on disk and what's in the log. All right, any questions about Aries? So let's do a live demo. I've never tried this. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I wrote the code. I haven't even tested it. All right, so... Um, so we're going to run MySQL, MySQL 5.7. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a single table. 
called wall demo, and it's going to have a single tuple with 10 fields, right? <laughs> Zero to nine. And I'm going to write a really simple Python script that is just going to go into a for loop, or, 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 or infinite loop, and it's going to try to update in a transaction, it's going to update every single field one by one. So I have 10 fields in a transaction, I'll have 10 updates, and it's just going to add one to the counter. And so we said that the database should not have any partial updates, right? Right, so this, this, is, my, this is my code here. I right, really, it's hard to read, but like, while forever, loop through, in, in each iteration of the while loop, loop through and execute this query here that's just going to take whatever each field and add one to it one by one. And in transaction, and then the transaction commits here. So then while this is running, I'm going to go ahead and do a, a, a hard kill on the database server, right? And assuming the database is, the system is running fast enough, it, and hopefully it'll be running in the middle of a transaction. And then we'll turn the system back on, look in, look in the, the, the system log, and see whether it... Uh, when it comes back online, whether it's correct that each entry is always one more than the, the previous one, right? Because if it's, if it's not, then we know we have a partial update. Like if it crashed while I was updating value five, so this thing got updated to six, and then we crashed here before we could update this thing to seven, we would come, we would come back online and see that this was six and this was six. So if any two fields that are next to each other are the same, then we know it didn't recover this correctly, okay? All right, live demo, let's see what happens. So our, our thing is running, Oops, sorry, I can do a select here, right, we see it's running, doing something. So then now in, for MySQL, they have this thing called the, the PID file that basically tells you what the current PID is for, for your, the, the, the database server here. So I'm just going to do a kill-9 on this, right, and then Python came along and says I lost my connection, right. So. Let's go see what's in the log. All right, so this is going to be not the write-ahead log. This is going to be like the debug log for MySQL. It basically tells you what's going on when you start up. And actually, let's, let's, do, it, let's do it up here so we can see it better. Right, so this was running and then it got killed. So now what we'll do is uh, service MySQL status should be down. Active. Mm, let's try that, restart. Oh, perfect, all right, so the top guy started up again. Um, So up here, right, we, we turned the thing on, MySQL booted up. And someone here is just say recover from the log. Yeah, a bunch of rollback seven segments, that's not the same thing. Non non redo rollback segments are active. Blah, blah, blah. All right. It did something, right? But I killed it. So now let's go back and connect our database. And voila, there we go, right? 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. There you go. Now, presumably, this, the, the, you know, I didn't kill it in the meet, you know, while I was in between a transaction and the for loop, but you know, it was unlikely that it maybe did. So again, this just showed you that I, if I didn't have right ahead logging and doing this correctly, I would have come back and saw a partial transaction. But because it knew to undo changes from a transaction that did not commit before I killed it, then it knows to reverse that change. Actually, what I should have done, I should have had this thing printed out, like what update it, it left off with, and we, we could have seen that it, it, the last one I did, but that's fine. Take my word for it, it my SQL has right ahead logging, okay? <laughs> All right, so at this point in the semester, you're awesome. Right? You can go off and build your own single node database system. You can do transactions, you can do logging, you can do indexes. 
right? So now that we understand the basics of single node databases, we can now start talking about distributed databases. All the same techniques and same things, problems we talked about on, on, on single node systems up to this point, they exist in distributed databases. But now there's other things we have to worry about, like uh, consistency becomes a big problem now. Uh, how do you keep short track that the, the different nodes in your database are going to be in sync? So for the next three lectures, we're going to talk about transactional, uh, transactional distributed databases, transactional analytical databases, and then we'll do a new lecture on sort of these cloud serverless databases that are, that are, that, that are sort of coming uh, more prominent. Okay? Any questions? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> What is it? Yes! It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I could do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so yeah, I'm a fool cause I drink proof. Quick the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come! Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watts, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>